Welcome to CBT Nuggets Mastering VMware vSphere version 5. I'm Greg Shields. Let me guess what's uh, probably going on right now. Maybe you were sitting around working with your group policy, maybe swapping out a network card, or just doing whatever it is that's involved with the tasks of IT, and someone walks up to your desk and slaps down some CDs or DVDs for a new piece of software called VMware vSphere. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you're being elevated from the good old traditional IT world of physical computers and servers and desktops, and you're being asked to quickly become educated and quickly evolve into this whole world of virtualization. You've probably spent some time looking at virtualization. I mean, you've, you're probably familiar with it. You can't read anywhere in the IT press these days without coming across an article or two on, on virtualization itself. But really getting down into the click-by-click -click of how you would design and construct and operate and, and make sure that it, that whole virtualization environment stays running over the extended period of time, well, that may not be something that necessarily you have a lot of experience with. And so consequently, you've decided, I'm going to go learn this thing. Well, I'm glad you have. As I mentioned, my name is Greg Shields, and I've been working with virtualization since its very beginnings. And uh, I have the unique opportunity to, once again, put together a video training series here with CBT Nuggets to assist you with mastering this new technology that we think of as VMware vSphere. Uh, I put together 20 of these different nuggets where essentially you and I are going to spend some time going through that whole design, build, and operate activity as it relates to vSphere. And I hope that over the, the extended period of time that I can spend some time well, helping you understand how to make good decisions whenever you do this in production. And also, if you plan on taking that VCP examination, well, how to well, be successful on that VCP examination. Uh, in this series, we're going to spend some time talking about a whole series of topics. Right? Uh, I want you to help, first and foremost, I want you to understand really why virtualization has really, really gone from this amazing, cool thing that no one really understands to just something that you do. Uh, virtualization's rapid dominance at the data center has occurred over an extremely fast period of time. We, it wasn't that many years ago when all of our servers were physical boxes and we were marching into the data center to make any changes to them. But the, uh, the incorporation and the embrace of virtualization almost universally across IT organizations is, is a testament to just the benefits that it can provide to both you as an IT person and also as your business as someone needing to accomplish something with the benefits of computing. So this series attempts to kind of solve two things. First and foremost, it, it tends to help you understand how to build, configure, operate vSphere. Uh, by the end of this, you're going to hopefully understand all of the different, the, the real vagarities associated with working with vSphere and the buttons you need to click and all that sort of click here, then click here sort of stuff that's required to put a vCenter environment up in operations. Now, the second piece of this is also understanding, hopefully from myself, just the things that I have learned over the years that I can hopefully impart to you that are good decisions, right? good ways to implement things, best practices for implementing vSphere. Because vSphere is, there are a lot of moving parts. And you can connect those moving parts in a lot of incorrect ways. And there are only a few really correct ways that will ensure that you are successful both in the short run as as your environment grows over time. So I hope to be able to kind of share with you what I've learned over the years and, and help you be successful there. And, and then thirdly also is prepping for that all-important VCP exam. Now, uh, the, the, the VMware Certified Professional exam is a certification exam, obviously, from VMware. It's a single exam. Uh, I would highly recommend uh, dropping by VMware.com and picking up the VCP5 exam blueprint. Now, the exam blueprint, excellent document, an excellent piece of work. Uh, VMware has done a really, really good job of outlining step by step and task by task all the things that you've got to know in order to be able to take that exam. And, you know, if you're not interested in the exam, if the taking that exam is not something that is going to be useful for you or your career, don't worry, because the focus here is not necessarily specifically 
getting you ready for those questions. The focus here is helping you understand what virtualization is and how it works best with, uh, with vSphere. But along the way, I may make mention from time to time where certain elements are just good to know because they tend to be noted uh, on the exam. They tend to be exam type things. And so if you are intending on taking that exam, take a look at that VCP exam blueprint down there. It's, uh, it's on VMware.com. It's in their education certification location where you can learn very specifically what you need to know. You will find that the items in that blueprint, so the, the breakdown structure of all the knowledge that you need to know, I've kind of taken the information from that document, refactored it into a, a slightly better storyline, but you'll see kind of the same actions found here in this training series that you kind of will see inside of the blueprint. And part of that's purposeful because the exam intends to validate that you know what you need to know. But in order to get there, well, you've probably got to know those things also. And so kind of generally aligning how you will construct your vSphere environment according to that blueprint in a lot of ways assists you down solving both of those goals. Now, the first thing I really want to talk about here, and, and we're not actually going to get into the click by click until we get to nugget number three, uh, because b before you actually even start putting bits into disks, you got to understand really what the role of virtualization is in the data center and also what the role of vSphere is in and amongst everything. And recognizing virtualization's really rapid dominance of, of the data center is an important understanding for, in many ways, sort of justifying your move towards virtualization. I, I, I'd say often that virtualization has very, very rapidly gone from a really cool thing. Right? There was a time period not that many years ago where virtualization was the hottest thing coming and going. And in a very short period of time, it went from a, a really exciting thing to just kind of something you do. And so today, this is, I'm filming this somewhere near the end of 2011. So in, in this time period, a very large, if not almost majority of all IT workloads these days are being run inside of a virtual environment. IT has subscribed to virtualization because virtualization presents some very important benefits, such as compression, consolidation, efficiency, optimization. You know, the, the, for most environments, for most businesses, the number one reason why we move to virtualization is just simply because, well, I have 50 servers, and all of those servers are running at 5% utilization, and it's a huge waste of power and a huge waste of space. So if I squish those 50 servers down so I can fit 10 servers onto one server, well, then I just have less stuff that I have to manage in the physical world. Right? The, 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 the less I have to manage means the less to power, less to cool, just less to deal with. Now, there's a further benefit there, too. I mean, not just the space, power, and cooling reduction bits, but the other bit there is the fact that a virtual server is just so much, more f so much faster to get deployed. If I ask you the question today, okay, and I am, so how long does it take between the time somebody walks into your office and says, hey, uh, we need a new server, and when that server is actually in the rack and producing whatever service they need? Right? So if somebody walks in and says, look, we need another SQL server today, how long does it take? I mean, can you do that in a day? Can you do it in five days? Some, some people, commonly, honestly, the, the, the most common answer I get out of people when I ask them that question is, well, it takes me about a month, right? Does it take you a month? I mean, if somebody comes into your office today and says, I need a new server, could it take 30 days to get a new server? Possibly. Think about that, right? You need a new server, and so you've got to go spec one out, and then you've got to go call Dell or IBM or HP or whoever uh, handles your servers. You've got to tell them what you want. They've got to build it. They've got to ship it to you. You've got to unbox it. You've got to find space in the rack. You've got to put it in the rack and network it and connect it to storage and add an operating system and then put on whatever applications are required. And there's probably nine levels of process and change control that you've got to go through in order to do that. So the, the, the time difference between a new service request and a new service these days is honestly measured in a month or more. It's measured in weeks. 
Well, when you move to virtualization, virtualization says, all right, what if I just have a bunch of equipment that is available and that creates an amount of supply, so, so a certain supply of resources that I can then apply to virtual machines. And I can then rapidly deploy new virtual machines when that service request comes in. As you'll find out a little later on, with uh, the right technologies in place, you can create very nice templates and then clone a VM from a template so that you know you have a configuration controlled VM right from the get go. And if you have enough resource supply, if you have enough CPU and memory and network and storage, well, you're going to be able to provision that virtual machine and you'll have that virtual machine up in minutes or hours instead of a month. That's great. That's a great thing for management. That's a great thing for reducing the, 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 the drag that IT places on business agility. I know those are businessy kinds of topics, but you know every time that your, your business comes to you and they have to plan a month ahead of time for those sorts of things, well, that's not a great deal. Also, virtualization, when you implement the right functions, right, when you implement the right protective measures that, that, that come with virtualization, you also reduce the risk of server failure. Now, depending on what level of protections you want to put in place, the server itself might fail, right? VMware's HA, if I lose a, a host, I'm going to lose that virtual machine, but I'm going to lose it for, I don't know, three minutes, five minutes at the most, before it automatically powers on somewhere else. When was the last time you were out at a barbecue? And uh, it's a Saturday afternoon, maybe you've had a beer or two, um, you know, you're, you're cooking up steaks and your pager goes off because one of your servers has failed. Well, how many minutes does it take for you to get that server back online and running again? You, know, you might have to, you know, put down the barbecue tongs and get in your car and drive to work. And if you're living on the other side of town, well, there could be traffic. Uh, it, so it could take a really long period of time to get that server back up and operational again. So just the, the sheer operational issues associated with server failure and, and applying HA to that or, or DRS or even fault tolerance to that really reduces the amount of downtime that a server is going to have whenever actual downtime occurs. So, so virtualization in and of itself really improves the availability of services and it also means that you can perhaps you can stay at the barbecue instead of having to drive in to work. It also allows you to optimize the use of those expensive physical resources. Right? I think I mentioned that, um, f you know, I don't know, the average utilization of a Windows server industry-wide, I have been told, is somewhere in like 5 to 7% worldwide. So you go to any Windows server and 93 to 95% of the time, that Windows server is just idly flipping ones and zeros back and forth to keep itself busy until it needs to actually do something. And, and I don't know, if, if you're a manager and you have a person, an employee, that's only working 7% you know, of the time, what are you going to do with that employee? Well, you're probably going to either give them more work or tell them that they need to go find another job. But why do we do this with our servers? It's expensive. They're very expensive. And then running them with power and cooling is even more expensive. So squishing together those unused processor cycles uh, across many servers allows us to have a more optimized use of those expensive physical resources. Virtualization in and of itself means that I'm getting more out of the stuff that I've paid for, and that's great. A real big benefit here, too, is this whole notion of disaster recovery and making disaster recovery finally cost-effective. I, I have a buddy of mine who was working in a, it was a financial services organization. And this is back in the way old days, prior to virtualization. And because they were financial services, they had to have a disaster recovery site because of, I mean, it's people's money. And the way that they did a disaster recovery site is when he went to go build a server, then he would go build another server, and he would drive the other server over to the other data center. And if he had to make a change on the first one, he would have to drive over to the other data center and make a change on the second one really not cost effective as a disaster recovery scenario. Now with virtualization, however, I have the ability to encapsulate all the configurations that is a virtual machine down to just one single file. Right? A virtual disk is a virtual disk and it's one file large. So with that virtual disk in my hands, I can then replicate the contents of that virtual disk from one place to another. And so it creates this really cost-effective sense of disaster recovery. It, it's not, I don't know, 
Thank you.